Our story is set in the present day. A mother waiting home for her son, Frammy, to surprise him with friends and family for a birthday party. Right, when he comes in, keep quiet, and then we all shout happy birthday, okay? He ate surprises. <laughs> oh, do you know, where is he? He should have been back by now. I'll ring his phone again. No answer. He's turned it off. I'll leave a message. Francis, what's the point of having a phone if you don't answer it? This takes me back. We moved to St Andrew's Gardens from a house that was damp and so overrun with rats. We got the kids to light candles in front of a shut shrine devoted to Our Lady when they went to bed. Well, the truth was, the light from the burning candles kept the rats away from them when they slept. Early one morning, we found a rat lying on top of one of the kids' faces. Yeah, well, we moved out that day. Do you remember back then? There was no fridge. It was just a cold slab in the larder. Four in a bed covered in an overcoat. <laughs> oh. Do you know, we felt we'd hit the jackpot when we moved to the top landing of what was known as the Bull Ring. We were facing west, and the sunsets were incredible. We watched the city grow through the 60s. I knew you could see Snowden on a clear day. Yeah, we were a big family then. Seven of us, all lived on top of each other. Three bedrooms, and Grandad lived with us. He had his own bedroom. Grandad was a docker. Kids would pull the boots off him when he came in from work. He was that exhausted, he couldn't pull them off himself. He didn't want the lads to follow in his footsteps like all their uncles had. All five of them worked on the docks. They liked being dockers because they had their freedom. They lost money when they went on strike. In 1951, everyone got sacked and then reinstated. And the men would fight to get in the pen. They were called pens because the men were treated like animals. Some of the pens had floors, some of them just had a, a rail and a turnstile. Box 10, South End. Yeah, that was Grandad's pen. But there were no toilets. There was nowhere to wash, nowhere to get a cup of tea. The wages and the conditions were atrocious. They were dehumanised. But they all looked after each other. They set up their own welfare. If a man's wife was in hospital, say, they would do his job for him, tell him to come back when she was well. Or if the kids were sick, they'd say, go home. Then they'd throw a tarp or a muster on the ground and everyone would throw money in. I didn't like that, though. <laughs> My Joe kept himself to himself. So we only got a tenner when he was hurt, whereas the loud mouths got, say, 40 quid. If they knew something good was coming in on the ships, they go early as the pen opened air. Deckhands, porters, counters, checkers. The ship's boss, they'd all be there. The amount of men needed was dictated by the cargo. There'd be eight men below in the hold. Sometimes they'd build a Glasgow. Now, Liverpool dockers had a worldwide reputation for being good workers. If there was nothing in when they went to the pen in the morning, go back in the afternoon, get the book stamped. Maybe there'd be a chance of nights in Birkenhead. But there was always a bit of cherry picking going on. If there was no work, they'd go back the next day, start again. Then, Grandad was the only person bringing money in. There were days when there was no work. We had no money for food. Kids went to bed without tea. Sugar butties if they were lucky. Although he managed to get to the pub every night. That was a cause of friction. I remember getting our tea on the slate off the chicken. They would actually write it down, literally, on the slate. Five fish and chips or whatever it was to be paid on Thursday. So, times we had to go to the money lenders to lend five bob. See, we all take it for granted now. Then the money lender would knock, we'd all pretend to run in. Turn the big lights off, Grandad would shout. <laughs> oh, you laugh now. <laughs> oh, if the doggers didn't laugh, they were dead. That's why all the best comedians came off the docks. You know, if they didn't laugh, they'd cry. On our Franny's fourth birthday, I mean, he didn't feel well. Went to sleep with a high temperature. And 
he woke up paralysed. Oh, he had polio, you see. You know, when he was little. Oh, that was a kid's disease then. It was terrible. He was in isolation in Fazakali for six months and spent some time in an iron lung. I mean, fortunately, his respiratory muscles hadn't been affected, but I, I couldn't go in and see him at first. I wasn't allowed. And the nurse came round to ours, took all the bedding and the toys away and burnt them. I said, what? She said, oh yes, everything. Everything, all the toys and bedding have to be burnt. I had a big argument over that. I mean, where was I supposed to get the money from to replace everything? After six months, I could visit him, but I had to wear a mask and a, a full gown, gloves. And all he wanted was his man. But I couldn't touch him. I mean, polio was highly contagious. We were treated like lepers. I mean, everyone thought they could catch it. His dad, Joe, used to walk him to Gladstone Dock every single day for 12 months to build up the strength in his legs and to get him used to, you know, the, the calibre. He'd walk down the path to the docks. Joe would tell him stories about his mates and all the funny nicknames they had for them, like him, the reluctant plumber. He never did attack. <laughs> stutter and Tom, he had a stutter. The male model. I'm not sure why they called him that. Perhaps he fancied himself, eh? <laughs> And they, they climbed the 64 steps on the way back home up to ours. There was a tradition in our family. You join the Merchant Navy or you work on the docks, and they were proud dockers. Our Franny wanted to see the world or follow in Grandad's footsteps. Polio. No chance of him working on the docks. Thank God. Joe was on the sick. Ah, the less you did on the docks, the more you got paid. Half ton bales they were lifting. They put the lorry over the scales to work faster. There was copper, cigar copper, blister copper, onions, melons, rags, bales of wet hides, tied up and bundled, thrown on a net. Oh God, they were heavy. And he was working with a stretcher. It was a hook with, you know, like little teeth on it so that they didn't damage the bags. Yeah. And he was stacking the load on the wagon, pulling down with all his might. Mm -hmm. Missed the bag. Scratcher went right into his face. He lost an eye. Oh, men lost fingers and all sorts. I mean, the one thing about the hook is that when they went the bags, they were safer. Oh, we never let the kids see them, though. They were dangerous. Some days they'd have to roll barrels of pitch into the shed and there'd be signs saying, beware of anthrax. And they'd come home covered in it. A, a fine white powder and it didn't come off the bodies when they were washed. Carbon black, red ochre, it all had an effect on their health. They'd be working in a hatch, emptying cement bags, no matter how expert they were at dropping the bags, the cement dust blew everywhere, all over them. They took the names off the bags so the dockers didn't know what they were working with, but they did know. And all asbestos is bad. Their no, health and safety didn't exist till 1973. And all the women washed their gear by hand on a Saturday morning to have it ready for the Monday. Mothers, sisters, wives. I know so many women with COPD or dead from asbestos breathing in all the dust and the shite. They used to come home from work, stinking to high heaven after working with our conscious cargoes. I mean, you could smell them before they even got to the door. They were working with salted, wet hides. Oh, terrible smelling cargoes. Stinking boxes of glue, fish meals. No one would sit next to them on the bus. You know, if they'd been working in the seaport, they'd have to stand on the deck all the way home. I used to make them get dressed in the yard. It was a distinctive smell. they get a bath once a week with water from the back of the fire, or go to the wash house in Cornwall Street. That was the only salt water swimming pool. Our oh, Franny's gang used to go there. They dry themselves off with the vest. No spare towels in ours in them days. Our kids worked in bibbies. He smelled lovely. He smelled of soap. Do you know, you could tell where people worked by the smell of them. The Mackenzies all worked in Dunlops. Everyone in their family smelt of rubber. <coughs> the Perrys all worked in Ogden's and they all smelt of fags. Oh. Rubber. That was another dangerous cargo. 
massive balls of it that bounce all over the place. Or they cover the rubber and talcum powder, but once it had dropped, it would bounce into the air, and no one knew where it land. Joe's brother, Johnny, lost the fingers on his right hand, pulling the pin and the rope. But then the odds were dropped, and somehow or another, it landed on the bogey. He wasn't the same after that. I mean, they called him the bogey man. He wore a pure white bandage on his hand every day, until the day he died. You should look at the history of where they came to where they were before they were all sacked. 1949, the scheme started. Ended in 89 with Thatcher. You have to look back to go forward. The older doctors are entrenched pre-1967. That's when the changes came in. The younger sites wouldn't put up with what their fathers had to put up with. Oh, no boiler suits, gloves or boots. Well, they did get them thrown at them at times. No one put them on before the shop stewards demanded them to. Anyway, Grandad was home this night as he was working in between. Dockers had worked it out so the older fellas didn't have to do so much. They'd have the morning off, go in at lunchtime. The other fellow would have the afternoon off. They worked the magic clock. They went round and round all shift. It's an easy job, round and round the clock. <laughs> Didn't even get out the cab. Do you know, when Grandad retired, they gave him a clock. <laughs> What's all that about, eh? He should have been relaxing, not watching the rest of his life ticking away. Oh, God, where the hell is he? I'll try his mobile again. Francis! Where are you, son? You know what, worry. Will you ring me when you get this message? I can hear the foghorns. Anyway, so this night, our Franny had been out connecting with his little gang. Penny for the guy. They dressed little David up as the guy. And I told Franny to wear his shorts and run up to people so they could see his caliper. Pockets had bulged with money. All the gang had split the money. We choose it for housekeeping. They'd start collecting in September. <laughs> We'd improvise to put food on the table. Uh, they'd go round with a wheelbarrow and get tomato boxes and orange boxes, break them up to sell for firewood. Then they'd stand outside all the pubs in the area that was called the sign of the cross. Jam jars, steady bottles. They'd get a penny a bottle. You should have seen Hanson's on Great Mercy Street on a Saturday morning. All the kids would be queuing up to make a few bob. I'd send Franny round to pay his respects as soon as someone died. Or if they'd set the room out with the white sheet on the coffin on the table. Franny would stand by the coffin, all the neighbours would give him sixpence. <laughs> Do you know, there were times when we were waiting on someone to die, as that was a good little inner. Oh, you're laughing. It was. Do you know, the stairs were so narrow in the bullring, it would take six bearers to move with the coffin. And sometimes it'd be almost vertical at times on the stairs. The old teddy boys were notorious in those days, especially Roddy. They give the kids a shilling or so, and that was a lot then, sixpence. They must have admired the lads' initiative, holding out a jam jar to catch the coins off them. Well, little David, he lived in the tennies off Park Road. He was deaf in one ear after a school teacher had hit him round the head for messing around in the class. Yeah. Oh, he was a funny little kid. Terrible temper on him. He came over to ours impressed with the cutlery of all things. Well, there was stainless steel with T.J. Hughes stamped individually on each one. <laughs> I'd been over the road to T.J.'s one market day, had a cup of tea, and there was this sign saying, help yourselves to knives and forks. <laughs> so I did. I took an entire set for the whole family. <laughs> oh. Do you remember the corn of a sandwich? A police constable and a sergeant would throw empty milk bottles at them. There'd be about 30 kids chucking bottles at them. Oh, God, everyone was a thief back then. Well, this night, I was pleased to see them. I was desperate as our Granny hadn't come home from collecting Bollywood. He was out with little David and Jackie. I mean, Jackie was strong, and all the kids were a bit weary, as Jackie could outrun anybody, pick up the biggest bits of wood, swim a, swing a hammer around like no one else. And the muscles. I've never seen anything like it in my life. She could hit her Anders bowl so hard and tucked a hammer down the elastic of her knickers. <laughs> she should have been a man. 
She was the daughter of one of the dockers who worked with Grandad. She made friends with Franny and little David on the day out to Waterloo, you know, on the Ribble bus. We took our own tea, paid a deposit for the teapot. Her father was called a quiet man. He hardly ever spoke. He saw one of the dockers getting cut in half one day, diagonal-like, and the rope slipped and the cargo swung round and dropped on top of him. Terrible. Oh, they'd have a name for that today, wouldn't they, eh? Post-traumatic shock, I think. Anyway, this one night, the kids had made a steady. You know, a go-kart out of old prab wheels. And they do shifts, one would do lockout, one at the wheel, one on standby. They each had a go, and the next thing, well, I couldn't hear them anymore. And it was bitterly cold, and I shouted for Freddy to get in for his tea. No answer. And the first one, I didn't think that much of us, but as time went on, I, I started to feel uneasy. I went looking for him, and I, I saw Robbo, the leader of the gang, with Maureen and Kathleen. Where's our Freddy? But they didn't have a clue. Robbo had been playing footy, didn't see him. Oh, he was fearless, Robbo. He could jump right over the gaps between room, two roofs like he did it every day. But they were going home as the smog was coming down. Oh, it was a real pea super. You could hear the foghorns out in the Mersey. My blood ran cold. Franny was always hanging around Robbo. He admired him, he always wanted to be in his gang. But then people started to gather round, came up with a plan to search the area, told me not to worry. Bobby's came over to see what was going on, told me to go home, make a cup of tea, stay there in case he came back. More Bobby's turned up after a couple of hours. There was no sign of him, or little David. And then they, they looked under the beds in the cupboards. It was just procedure, he said. Ah, oh, they'll probably come home when they're hungry. Time went on, and I just knew something terrible had happened. Mrs. Kelly came in, and she was like, Oh, what's it like having a missing child? I thought you'd have been crying. I would have been crying if that was me. That still shocks me to this day. And some people love misery, don't they? And then Smokey, our Franny's dog, came back by himself. I mean, I couldn't feed my children, never mind a dog. But Franny brought him home one day, got him off a cocky watchman. Well, I couldn't say no when he looked at me with them big eyes. By this time, half of Liverpool's out looking for them. Robbo was showing the search party, the bombed out houses where they'd been to get the best bomb he would. No, all the warehouses down the dock road where they played, robbed peanuts and brown sugar, stuff like that. A little rip in the sack, they fill the pockets. <laughs> they searched all the haunts down that end. Park Lane down to the dark, Hill Street, Stanhope Street, Parliament Street. There was no sign of them. Oh, the front door opened, people came and went, and I just sat there alone. I nearly lost him once with the polio. I stared at the wallpaper, memorised the pattern. I could hear people speaking, but I wasn't listening. It was just like a muffle in the ears. Being a big family, he didn't have his own room or his own pillow or toys or anything like that. But when I looked, I found an old toffee tin with a picture of a puppy on the lid. And inside was one Ollie. Christmas snowball with Santa on a rocket and the water had dried up and the plastic had a yellow tinge. A toy soldier with a head missing. I'd stood on that once and went flying one day. Franny playing in the doorway. Oh, I was fuming. He cried because I cut my leg. <laughs> Isn't it funny how he kept that? Oh, oh, one piece of a Hornby double O train track, one piece. He found that in the street. I promised him one day I'd buy a train track and an engine because he was so obsessed with the overhead railway. Not much to show for a little life, was it? I had to stop myself from thinking about what hymns to sing at his funeral. <laughs> I mean, isn't it funny the way your mind works? And at half two in the morning, they found the steely by the pier head. Smashed to bits. Pram wheels off the go-kart were bent. 
the doctor gave me a sedative when he picked me up off the floor and that was that. Oh, well, I'll try his mobile again. No answer. I came round in the morning and the light was shining through the window and the police were standing in the hall. And they didn't want to get me hopes up. But they just heard that some dockers over the water had seen a barge heading towards the west flow, you know, to the right of Camel Lairds. And a pilot ship was guiding the barge to the quay. They found two boys hiding under the tarpaulin. Well, I, I know our Franny can't swim, so I didn't think it could be him. The dockers had pulled the barge out the water, tried to warm them up. And while they were waiting for an ambulance, they were telling the dockers what happened to them. Little David had run off in a temper, got lost in the smog. And our Franny was shouting and shouting, but little David couldn't hear him. They were down by the pier head, you know, where the Abel's dredgers used to come in. You know where Granada Studios was in the Albert Dock? Well, there, I can't remember what the dock's called now. But Franny had taken one of the cocky watchman's oil-filled lamps that glowed red. Uh, they'd all been lined up to indicate a hazard to traffic or something. And he'd lifted the lamp in front of his face as he ran along. And he saw little David right near the water's edge leaning on the chains. And then without a sound, he slipped into the water. Franny was shouting to him and he leaned over to try and catch hold of him, but it was too late. And then our Franny fell down and landed in the river. Well, how did you get into the barge, son? One of the dockers asked. Googie saved us. He dragged us onto the barge with his claw. He had a claw that had two prongs on like a pirate. And he, he grabbed David first. And then he stuck in me caliber and he pulled me up just as I was going back down onto the water. The dockers fell silent as they listened to the boys. Googie had told them he would take them on the trip of their lives. He covered them up with jumpers that were on the barge and told them to lie close to each other to keep warm while he kept a look out for ships, guided the barge to the quay. Googie was special, he told them. He was top dog cock of the gang, the best footy player, and was in the darts team and the hollow pub that was also called Kenny's. And, and he told them Googie'd love boxing, and Ken Gardens was his HQ. And he showed them where the River Mersey narrows once they passed the pier head. And he pointed out the sloin where all the ships would wait. And he told Franny to keep his claw to remind him of the adventures on the river. What did this Googie look like? The doctor's asked him. Franny said he was the same height as his nan, about five foot four, and Googie said he was 42 now. And he was a bit small and stocky for a boxer. He was a bit paunchy and squat. Then the men still looked at each other as Franny showed them the doctor's hook with the initials G-O-G -G scratched into the wooden handle. Gerard Oliver O'Gorman, also known as Googie, was 20 years old when he was standing on the quay of Gladstone Dock, talking to the foreman about the lack of safety on the docks. He had his everyday clothes on, holes in his shoes. Then Googie slipped and fell between the ship and the quay and banged his head. The dockers tried, but they couldn't get them out. Couldn't get him out. It was too dangerous. Googie never came back up again. He was declared missing, presumed dead. Right, here he is now, he is already. Come on. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday.